Hello and welcome back to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. This is a time to have Girlfriend Doctor conversations and um, I'm going to do that with another Girlfriend Doctor of mine, a good friend of mine, Dr. Filmena Trindade, who is in Portugal and I first met her in 2009, exactly remember meeting her, in 2009 at an Institute of Functional Medicine conference in um, Hollywood, Florida. and. I was speaking on PMS and mood disorders, and she was speaking on the adrenals. And I recognized her accent to be Portuguese. And of course I was enthralled with what she was saying, but also the humanity with which she teaches and approaches her patients and her cases and her own journey into the world of functional medicine plus, right? There's so much that we can do as, um, and for our own lives as as women to be empowered and what we know as physicians and particularly when our own journey has taken us down some rocky roads so i'm excited to share some cases to talk about some stories to um, really have some amazing girlfriend actor time and i want you to join me in this you're going to want a pen and a paper to make some notes and see yourself in the stories that we share today so join me in welcoming the very esteemed amazing dr filmena trindade hello filmena welcome to the girlfriend doctor show thank you it's such a pleasure to be here with you i know it's great and and you are in the azores right now can't wait to yes, come visit you there. I know. I, I'm going to start uh, like uh, sending you these notes of little re gentle reminders, and then I'll really nudge you because we've been talking about this and we haven't done it yet. We and haven't you're done always it yet. welcome. But uh, in the summer, when I do my retreats, will really sort of be the best time because there's so much to do and see, and, and it's such a healing island. Well, they say the Azores are just magical. And since my family roots and, and another part of our story is that when uh, I was lecturing in Portugal, you were lecturing in Portugal as well, way back. Gosh, when was that? 20, uh, 2010, I think. 10, 2010. Yeah. And so I came with my whole family to Portugal. My sweet dad was there and he's Portuguese. His family's from the Azores, uh, uh, San Miguel. So our, our heritage is on the Azores. We were in the mainland and went all around Portugal, but didn't make it to the islands. And you're on San George. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Which is in I, the center group. And, and so you've that... been doing retreats there for a long time. Yeah, I stopped them around COVID, but I've been doing them, uh, I think, since like 2012, um, 2011, 2012. And uh, I've kept them small. Um, now I'm working on building a healing center so I can do a little bit larger groups and also provide um, a health center for the local population because yeah. health care here can be a little problematic at times. Um, yeah. So it's been a big project and a busy one, but a good one. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm definitely going to come out there. Well, let's talk about some stories. They were, you were just telling me about a patient that you just saw. And I wanted to share because, you know, for our audience to see where they're at and what's possible and the approach that we take that's different, that's unique, that's empowering and not disempowering. So I would love for you to share about your client that you just saw. Well, so this is a 39 year old uh, woman who has uh, is very typical of many of my patients where they've had to become sort of their own best doctor, even though they didn't know where to start, but they started somewhere and, and just really started learning and researching because they weren't getting the answers from their physicians, unfortunately. And they would have multiple complaints like she can't sleep, her, um, Menzies are starting to get shorter. She's tired all the time. Her hair is falling out. She had to beg to have a thyroid antibody test done because her provider just felt like that wasn't really important because her TSH was normal. Uh, that's the sort of the conventional way of looking at thyroid instead of looking at all the different hormones that are made and how we convert to the active hormone. 
And um, she's a little bit of her, at her wit's end in the sense that she wasn't getting the answers. And um, a person, she, um, among other things, she's a wedding planner and she happened to plan the wedding for someone who's a daughter of a good friend of mine and someone that I've met and talked to actually um, talked to her at IFM. And um, she finally got in to see me and it, it's the sort of, to me, it, it still makes me really angry that women have to go through this in the yeah. sense that their symptoms are discounted and they're basically told, oh, you're depressed. You need a SSRI or um, no, it can't be your thyroid because your TSH is normal. And there's no this in-depth looking or connecting the dots and trying to figure out, you know, why is this patient coming in with these complaints? It's not just looking at a laboratory reference range and saying, oh, you're normal. It's not possible. You're not normal. You may be within the reference range that maybe hasn't changed in 50 years. So I feel like in some ways, uh, she is very typical of that person, especially women, because I see more women who will have multiple complaints. But instead of looking at their complaints and trying to figure out where does this fit and how does it, is there a commonality? among their complaints do we have a common cause or causes it's more like well this lab is normal because it's within the reference range which does not equal normal you know most laboratories have not changed their reference ranges in 50 years and those reference ranges were used to detect disease which in many cases is 25 percent of normal function that's not optimal function and some of them have not even been really kept up with the literature and I still see patients with the B12 in the 300s, which I haven't done hers yet, but I, I am pretty sure it's going to be there and considered normal because the reference range goes down to 210. But we have literature since 1996 and some even earlier. That's just the ones I remember showing that you need a B12 serum level to be at least 600 to be functional. So it, she's just pretty typical of that patient who has multiple complaints, but nobody's connecting the dots and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And the fact that now that she's having some PMS symptoms and her cycles are getting shorter, it's probably an upstream hormone. And we have to look at the whole, all the hormones more as a symphony. So it's part of what's going on with, us, with their thyroid, but also what's going on with their adrenals as well as insulin, because she may also be insulin resistant and that can cause a lot of downstream effects. It's just frustrating to um, not see it change. You know, I've been doing this now for over 20 years. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I, I think about that every day, even like one of the things I put out to my community was, okay, here's the four key tests that I want to look at. I and mean, if you're not able to get other tests, you're going in for routine blood work, just get these four tests, a vitamin D, 25 hydroxy, an HSCRP, so a highly sensitive C-reactive protein, a DHEAS to assess the adrenal glands and a hemoglobin A1C. And this client, 60 years old, you know, with um, a, uh, you know, uh, a long history of medical complaints, hypertension, and they wouldn't do those tests. They wouldn't do those tests. Like, oh, they're not necessary. It's not indicated. And I'm like, what does has to be indicated? What symptoms have to be glaring in your face until it's indicated? And we know that by the time we see changes in the blood work at the functional level, it's been, you know, there's been abnormalities yeah. for decades for decades do Absolutely. we wait to diagnose the cancer do we prevent it and um and the list goes on and and then the other piece too because especially let's tie in the adrenal stressors and insulin resistance I mean, there's such this intri oh, yeah. intricate connection and um yeah so i'd Absolutely. love and uh, y'all and, and it Philomena, goes both ways yeah, I got to tell you, Philomena, you know, Philomena is an expert on the adrenal glands. She lectures around the world to physicians from, I mean, you know, for, since I've known her since, you know, the early 2000s, she's been lecturing and training physicians. Gosh, we've known each other a while, my friend. 
and um, and especially especially on this area, but then the cutting edge aspects that you know we know that are science based, evidence based, that there's good research. It's just not our standard medical practice. So this connection between adrenals and insulin resistance is key. Oh my gosh, Phil Mena, we're going to talk like girlfriends right now. I had this client in my office the other day, 5.8 hemoglobin A1C, told she's completely normal. I'm like, oh, well, you're just at 30% increased risk of dementia. But other than that, you know, let's, we kind of slapped a continuous glucose monitor on her. She's doing keto green 16 as we speak. And, um, and like in two months, we'll get that down to, you know, an optimal range. I mean, that quickly. Exactly. Oh. And that, I mean, things like that uh, with insulin resistance, the earlier you diagnose it, the easier it is to reverse. And it's on this continuum, right? You can be insulin sensitive you develop insulin resistance and we need to figure why we know that now it's really damaged to the pancreatic beta cell we need to figure out what did it and sometimes it's multifactorial and if you continue along that path you can get impaired glucose tolerance you can get pre-diabetic you can go to diabetes but more and more we're seeing women perimenopausal women especially and even younger women women with pcos or women with pms where they're insulin resistant they may have changes in their hemoglobin A1C. They may even not, depending on where you're catching them on that continuum, but many of them are not progressing. And they're sort of being discounted by most of our more traditional colleagues because they're not diabetic, right? No, they're not pre-diabetic, but they're mm-hmm. not looking at the risk and the fact that they're at very high risk for dementia, just like you said, for cardiovascular disease. You know, women still die first and foremost of cardiovascular disease, not of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But yet there's not a lot of focus on it. And in many cases, you can develop insulin resistance due to HP axis dysfunction because of what's going on to level of the adrenals. You know, just stress, right? Elevated cortisol levels can increase your insulin levels. It can damage your pancreatic beta cell. It can increase the permeability in your gut. So, and that can lead to changes in the gut microbiome, which can be the reason why, you know, you develop insulin resistance. The opposite is true too. I mean, if you have high insulin levels, it's going to affect your adrenals. But I see a lot more sort of the, uh, you're having high insulin affecting the adrenals, but also the opposite, high cortisol levels being what leads to insulin resistance. It's, you know, a two-way street. And I find more and more women that are insulin resistant, younger and younger. And so if it's, one, it's the root cause, I feel, of PCOS. Yeah. But the yeah. problem is it puts them at such high risk for cardiovascular disease earlier on, as well as dementia. And that's not really being, I feel like that's not addressed, even though the literature is there. I mean, since 2004, we have a consensus statement from the American College of Cardiologies and the American Endocrinology Association that women with PMS, PCOS, especially PCOS, those, there's more studies on women with PCOS, that we should be looking at these expanded lipid panels and we should be looking at other markers to assess inflammation and to look at their risk, but yet it's still not being adopted to clinical practice. How long do we need to wait? You know, after we have the literature, to start implementing it. Right, right, exactly. And then, and that's so true too with the hormonal therapy, bioidentical hormonal therapy, even vaginal estrogen in patients with breast cancer has been, we've known since 1999, a 12 year longitudinal study and follow up looked at the benefits of that and lower morbidity, lower mortality. But yet we buried all of that. Um, in the in the media hype from the backlash of the women's health initiative study so like when we're working and and then we're so aligned in this way that concept of the most important hormones of course the most important one oxytocin then we have insulin and cortisol but cortisol is like the key that unlocks the gate to those you know to healthy membranes it is like breaking down your boundaries so the barriers whether it's in the whether it shows up as leaky gut whether it shows up as leaky cardiovascular membranes or arthrosclerosis or leaky brains. Yep. And inflammation and amyloid plaque development. And, but now let's talk about the miracles, right? Like the ability to reverse this, your diagnosis is not your destiny folks, right? Your diagnosis is not your destiny. 
And there's so much we can do in that realm, especially the, the earlier on. You know, my best friend from high school called me up a few months ago and said, you know, I just came back from the doctor and they told me I was pre-diabetic. And I said, did you order an ultrasound? Did you look at your liver function? Because, you know, when you're pre-diabetic, you're a very high risk for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, right? Or even fatty liver, which you won't see in your laboratory values. And she says, well, he did order an ultrasound, but didn't do anything else and told me that we just needed to watch it and make sure I don't become diabetic. I wanted to jump through the phone line because that's the time you know, to really sort of be aggressive mm -hmm. and look upstream, you know, look at what's going on at the level of the adrenals. Mm -hmm. And something you mentioned earlier, I find is particularly important because we have so many tools in our toolkits in terms of reversing pancreatic beta cell dysfunction, improving insulin sensitivity, starting with the thoughts that we think, the food that we put in our mouth, you know, the supplements that we take, but really I want to do lifestyle modification first, you know, how much we move. And we have studies, we have the and diabetes prevention trial, which got stopped early and showed that how lifestyle modification was almost tw two times uh, more efficient than medication. But when you put lifestyle modification, I find with you know getting enough sleep, making sure that you're more anabolic and not catabolic, so you're not breaking down faster than you are building up, which is what happens when cortisol is high together with the tools like supplements and the tools we have in our toolkit, whether it's doing biofeedback or meditation, Tai Chi, Qigong, you name it, whatever it takes to sort of calm down your immune system. When you put all that together, we have so many different tools in our toolbox. But in particular, one that I wanted to mention, which you mentioned earlier um, in passing is DHEA. And the fact that the DHEA is, is, cap is anabolic, so it opposes cortisol. And most women get very deficient in DHEA, especially in the perimenopausal period. And all it takes sometimes is a very low amount of DHEA. And I, I use small amounts and I use it sublingually because it's a lot easier, I find, with less side effects. So it's a lot easier to supplement and then you have less side effects. But even vaginal DHEA, which you have, you know, you have that as that. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And the fact that that has been so controversial, and I know I'm jumping around here a bit, but it's been so controversial in women with breast cancer, yet there is no aromatase in the vagina. So DHEA will stay as DHEA. It will not go downstream to estrogen. And it's still being poo-pooed in terms of using it in women with breast cancer. And there's good research from Dr. Um, um, in Montreal, Dr. Um, Le, uh, Ferdinand Labrie, who did all the work on, on vaginal DHEA in breast cancer patients as well and showed no increased risk, yeah. decreased in fact, and complete safety and efficacy, no elevations in serum levels. And um, I do have oncologists that recommend it now. I do have many oncologists that recommend it. I have someone who's an active cancer patient and DHEA opposes, you know, many of like the, the viral, you know, for example, viruses and um, HPV virus, for instance. So that is, I mean, that's important to know. It can be one of the tools in our toolbox. So I want to, I want to, have girlfriend time here with you, Philomena, because I'm just now thinking about the Azores and my dear colleague, Dr. Margaret Christensen had visited you in the yeah. Azores. And you guys, if you haven't listened to my podcast with Dr. Margaret Christensen, please go listen to it. It was published in um, beginning of August, and we get into some really important stuff. We talk about viral load, viral burden, uh, environmental toxicities, and just tangible, amazing, cutting edge information. So she's just extraordinary, like my colleague yeah. and dear friend Philomena is. Yeah, Margaret's amazing. She did a retreat here with me. And uh, I miss her dearly. I haven't been as good at keeping up with patient with uh, girlfriends lately, just because, you know, we're building stages and things have been a little crazy. But Margaret's is like you, it's just one of those special people that you um, definitely want to lose touch with. Mm. They're like her changing lives, you know, changing people's lives every day. 
as you are and not the knowledge that immersion, immersion reboots, immersion restoration is really a key to wellness. And so I want you to like take us through an experience, say, like, what does that look like? What does an immersion experience with you look like? And what are some uh, of the cutting edge things you'll, you implement? And uh, you're talking about in terms of patients. With retreats, yeah. With all oh, with more. Well, uh, with retreats, I have two types of retreats. I originally started this as a physician heal thyself. Yeah. And it was really meant for my colleagues, but I ended up having a lot of patients interested. And so one of them is all total wellness. It's body, mind, and spirit. It's all about really bringing back balance into your life and figuring out where are you sort of emotionally, spiritually with what's going on in your life. You know, what has taken you out of balance? So we look, we look at, you know, where have you been thus far and where are you now? The first part of the day is more didactic. It's learning. Um, we get in touch with, you know, the child within us as well as the adult, as well as the higher self. And then uh, the second part of the day, we spend going to special places around the island that are very healing and they're particularly healing for whatever that they're dealing with. And whether we're, let's say we're talking more about the inner child and where are you at with that inner child inside. So we'll go to places that really foster healing that inner child. Same thing when we're talking about the Give an example of that. When, when you mean a uh, healing place that fosters healing of the inner child, what does that look like? So uh, we, we're a volcanic island. We're formed by three different volcanoes and three different types of volcanoes. And we have certain areas that you know, the rocks emit this very healing energy, very calming, you know, where you can really sort of calm down your nervous system and really fosters you sort of getting in touch with that part of yourself as well as some healing waters, right? I mean, we, we have lots of different places where you can go swimming and, uh, or even just pools where they may not be big enough for you to go swimming long distance, but just getting in, you sort of feel the energy that emanates from the volcanic rocks as well as from the ocean water. Wait, 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 so you're blowing my that. mind. So you mean nature to heal? You don't, we don't just go and then you give us Ambien, Xanax and, and SSRI. <laughs> No, and all the food we eat is homegrown. Most of it I plant, or my two helpers help me plant. So we eat from the earth, and the earth here is really, really rich. And uh, particularly, I mean, all the islands have a little bit different terrain. Um, there's nine islands. Eight of them are volcanic. One is not. But my island in particular, not it's mine, but it's where I'm at, um, <laughs> It's very, um, the soil is really, really rich. And so where I'm able to grow tropical fruit, subtropical, I can pretty much grow things year round. Um, the winter, sometimes it, it can be pretty harsh in the sense that there's a lot of wind and rain. So we, we like I have had a greenhouse and we're in the process of building another one. But it's so important to be aware of the fact that when you are eating something nutritious and you know it's nutritious and it's going to decrease inflammation, talk to your DNA, um, you know, increase your absorption, help your mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. If you know that while you're ingesting it, it increases its effect. So we talk a lot about that and incorporate that in. The fact that just having the right sort of mindset or knowing, you know, knowledge is power, knowing that increases its potential, which is, you know, pretty amazing. And then um, we do we do a little bit also about cultural uh, events, kind of knowing just a little bit, you know, about the island. Um, I have, like I'll have friends that come and entertain or just some local people. So we do a little bit of that, but it's really focused on um, sort of what do you need to be well and to bring back balance into your life. I do one other retreat that um, that's the one that's actually coming up on the ninth, which is uh, we do a little bit of that, but it's also more focused on delving deep into utilizing functional medicine tools uh, to address different patient concerns. This one's on gut health. So we're gonna look at sort of all aspects of gut 
and um, how are you digesting? How are you absorbing? How are you processing your food? As well as also, you know, we have to look at the fact that our brain is sometimes we say it's sort of like the second gut. Mm -hmm. So I, in many cases, I feel like it really is a second gut because uh, I feel like our abdomen or our gut, whatever goes on there, in, in a sense, is the first gut because it has more ways to communicate the first with the brain. brain than vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. So we talk a little bit about that as well as also enjoy the island because, um, you know, the Azores have sort of been known as the, the last paradise. But this island in particular, it's very rural, uh, but it has uh, a lot of beautiful sites. You know, we're the islands, it's the highest above sea level. I mean, we have areas on sea level, but we also have really high mountains and just, um, you know, beautiful cliffs, lots of um, waterfalls. So it's aesthetically pleasing, but there's just an energy that emanates from it that I really can't put into words that I find very conducive to healing. And even people have been through, you know, lots of trauma and need sort of more gentle uh, holding and um, uh, sort of approach that they, they don't necessarily have to confront their traumas head on. They may just need some assistance in helping their nervous system calm down. To recalibrate, and, right? To rewire, yeah. to recalibrate and and creating yeah. safe space with that. And then knowing that nature is medicine. And you guys like, you know, Phil Mena is from University of Southern California, right? Was your training and your residency. You see, you see, it was you see, not Southern California, but you see. Oh, University, University of, of California. California, University of California. And, um, and so, and so that is, you know, so this is important like that to be, to help patients and because Philomena cares deeply about helping patients heal, recognizing that trauma work is key to healing and the physical consequences mm -hmm. of trauma um, is just, you know, I mean, won't completely resolve without, without that trauma work, without that healing, without the resetting of the limbic system. And um, Philmena, can you talk about that? The resetting of the yeah. limbic system and limbic work, because I am and more and more seeing how our nervous systems are so tightly wired. There's mm -hmm. no relaxation and we've got to break these patterns. I know it in myself, Absolutely. my own life, <laughs> still working on it. <laughs> Me too. I, I feel like we're, you know, we have to first look within and right. see, you know, how can our, we heal ourselves teacher. and what do we need? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, just as you were talking, one thing that um, I wanted to make sure that I did forget to mention is that I'm constantly looking at what else can I learn about the HPA axis and our nervous system and how can we heal, you know, from traumatic events? How can we sort of reset, you know, our nervous system? And so I came across all this work on the fact that when we go through a traumatic process, we don't necessarily have to go into freeze, fright, flight, that there's this other pathway and it's called the tend and befriend. Yeah. And it's been more described in nurses, but we're learning more and more about it. But I, I have found that just knowing that is one way we can retrain our, our limbic system knowing that we do have this alternate pathway that we can utilize. It's like knowledge is power. And I, my biggest thing when I first learned about this is, well, how do I get patients there? You know, how do I do this? And then when I started just telling patients, you know, that we have this alternate pathway that we can access. I'm not sure exactly sure how I'm sort of learning this along the way. I found that just the fact that they knew it existed they were sort of able to go there, which is just amazing. I, I mean, we still, that. you know, we still have to work at trying to, you know, calm down, bring more of the parasympathetic, uh, figuring out what do you do? What do you need? What does your soul need? What does your body need? What feeds you? What gives you that aha every day? Because we all need to have something that feeds our soul that makes us feel good about who we are. So we work a lot at, at trying to, figure that out but just knowing 
but there's this accessory pathway. I don't even want to call it accessory. I want to say there's this other main pathway that we can go to has just been remarkable because I think that, especially as women, we tend to be the ones that we can sort of, you know, divert and multitask because we have so many different hormones uh, that uh, we're able to do that. And so just knowing it's there, that's available, has been one way that in some cases, we're just automatically able to go there. And others takes a little bit more work, really looking at, you know, what can we do, whether it's breathing, because breath is so important, and doing certain movements or brain spotting, which is you identify the area in the midbrain where your trauma is stored and trying to process it. You know, just being with yourself, I find that um, just actually today I had a patient that, that I asked, I said, why are you continuing to burn the candle at both ends when you know you are? And her answer was, I think I'm hiding. And I said, hiding from what? I said, I'm hiding from myself because I don't want to face the other things that are there. So if I'm busy then I don't have to go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. But just the fact that she knew that that's half the battle. Yep. Now it's really helping her go there and just say, well, maybe we don't have to confront it face on. Maybe we can just work on getting your body to relax. You know, sometimes we're so ingrained, you know, with conventional medicine that we forget that, it takes a sort of thinking in a different process, right? I mean, conventional medicine is so focused on cognitive behavioral therapy. We know cognitive behavioral therapy does not rewire your brain. Our brain is capable of changing itself, of rewiring itself. But it has. we have to use other ways. It's not cognitive behavioral therapy, which is we have to face it face on. As soon as you're ready, you know, we start peeling away and then, you know, we kind of hit it. Okay, this is the problem. No, right, no, right. Because our just... brain is organic. It's another physical organ. You know, it is physical. It's an organ. It has wiring. It has pathways and resetting them is so powerful. Um, and I had uh, done a, a podcast on brain spotting. Oh my gosh, I think it was pre pandemic. So it's been a long time ago. But I think that I means just so interesting. These aspects and being able to nourish the brain and feed the brain and, and and douse the fire in the brain that makes it harder to rewire. I want to touch on something that you said, Femena, with like the whole fight, flight, and freeze. We always hear that, like when you're stressed and it's cortisol, it's fight, flight, and freeze. And the tendon befriend is more oxytocin. You've got to have estrogen on board too for the tendon befriend piece as well, but the fight, flight, and freeze, being able to aware, be aware, how is that showing up? Is it showing up in escaping into TV, like fight, flight, or freeze? Free, mm -hmm. Flight is that escape. I like the word escape versus flight. Because yeah. you think flight, like just running or something. And escape to me is escapism. What does that look like? Fight is getting angry and getting pissed off and argumentative and sometimes fighting with yourself. I mean, I think of it that way. I think of flight as escape and that concept of am I escaping into alcoholism? Am I escaping into shopping? Am I escaping into zoning out in, you know, hours on social media? Like how is that physiology showing up in my life? And then all of a sudden you have awareness, you know what, I'm escaping right now. Okay, sometimes I need some escape, but am I escaping, is my escape therapeutic? Or is it destructive, like in the case of alcoholism? Is that is that a piece of that wiring? And then again, to rewire, to be able to heal from the, the destructive behaviors and patterns of behaviors that we can do. And workaholism is a well, you know, appreciated coping mechanism for many of us, you and I included here. Yes. And so recognizing that's a form of escape. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it, it's all it takes. It sometimes recognizing it, the light bulb goes on and you're able to automatically rewire. You know, Bethel Vanderkolk talked about how when you're in just your cortex, you know, there's certain things you can't do, right? You have to dip into the midbrain where it's sort of the 
more uh, reptilian brain, right? Less capable of rationalizing, but where traumas are stored. And if you can just dip in there and you're able to sort of bring things out and find other pathways, right? I, I love this book, The Body Keeps a Score, and it's all talking about how, you know, you're, there's cellular memory, you know, your body can remember uh, certain traumatic events that you've had and just working at the level of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or talk therapy, you can get, you know, for, it can help some people and you can get to a certain place, but you can't dip into those areas where trauma has been stored. But I've been amazed at how just being aware of it. Yeah, just that you awareness know. gives you, then you have a choice do this or or take a different pathway and yeah um and we know. have a lot of alternative pathways now too right i mean i've, I've just been reading about ketamine a friend of mine is opening yep. up a, a ketamine center and uh, i talk seen about what that. ketamine is yeah it definitely can be very therapeutic so how how have you what is ketamine and how have you seen it work so ketamine is and it's been used as anesthetic no, or it's been used in anesthesia. Uh, but lately it's been used both in, in forms, it can be intramuscular, it can be by mouth, it can be um, IV, um, as a way to deal with sort of past trauma. And amazing things, you know, have been happening. A friend of mine who's also a physician and has made had major issues with ADD and just not really being able to stay focused or even be present. Um, and I've known him for many years. Um, he called me up one day and said, you know, I'm kind of done. I'm done trying to be something that I'm not and trying to convince myself that I just need to work harder. So I've been reading up on this. I'm gonna go to this conference and I'm gonna do a, a ketamine treatment he came out and he's like a changed person. Hmm. He ended up doing a intensive and was there for a couple of weeks. Came back totally a different person. I'm able to sit down with him and go through a conversation. I can have a half hour conversation with him where he's not getting up or going to do something else or switching subjects. It was just amazing so that rewiring that rewiring yeah. the scattered like the scattered branches all of a sudden becoming really grounded roots and i and i think the the ther the therapeutic benefits to that um are you know i i think is the next is the next wave of medicine in the right hands in the right hands because that yeah. integration piece that in holding safe space that you know um in, you know, enforcing the new pathways, the um, I mean, enforcing is probably a strong word, but being able to hold space Connecting. for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Exactly, he's actually now opening up a center. And I think it's really important that you, no matter what you do, that, you know, you look behind who's doing it and that, mm -hmm. you know, it's um, ethical. They're right? certified, yeah. they're, uh, they've gone through the proper training. Uh, for a while, I was referring patients for neurofeedback, and I was getting some pretty good results. But I think, it, it, and again, you need to find someone who's qualified and has been certified. But um, I think that different, it's different people work differently. And so nobody's the same, right? This is all about personalizing our treatment. And uh, for some patients, one may work a little bit better than the other, right? Just mm -hmm. for him, ketamine was it mm -hmm. for someone else it might be brain spotting for someone else it might be emdr i think it's just really important that we try and figure out for each patient what's going to work best for them and as long as we've sort of done the foundation uh you know i call it sort of the good functional medicine uh, principles of how are you sleeping are we addressing that do you have support what are you putting in your mouth you know are you eating keto green for instance are you alkalinized you know looking at all that are you hydrating did you can you breathe do you know how to take a diaphragmatic breath right those things are so are to me it's like the basic foundation and then you try and figure out what work work better for that particular patient yeah yeah 
Thank you, Philmena. I'm grateful for the work that you're doing and um, and continued the continued work. Are you lecturing at A4M this year, by the way? Yeah, I'll be where I get to see you. Okay, I'll be there too. I'm lecturing as well. well good, good. We'll make sure to, to get Angeli there, Dr. Angeli Aiki, our dear friend. Yes. And um, and try to convince Dr. Ellie Campbell to join. Oh my gosh! I'll say if Dr. Margaret Christensen will come too, so she can oh, catch I up hope with so. you. That would be awesome. Yeah, have a little yeah. a little old girls reunion. Yes, yeah, and again another pioneer in this uh, yes. in this field. And so I thank you so much. Tell our audience how they can learn more about what you're doing and um, connect with you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. This is uh, so nice to catch up with you and see what you're doing. And so impressed by everything that uh, you're doing. You're such a Thank trailblazer. You. Thank you. And um, they can get a hold of me through my website. It's um, www.drtrindade.com. So my last name, drtrindade.com. They can also email me at info, I-N-F-O at drtrindade.com. Awesome. So come awesome. to my retreats. Hope to uh, see you one of these days. You, Anna, also. Yes, yes. I, I And I'll I, make time for you whenever you want to come. Oh my gosh. We, we, it's on our it's on our list. It is on our list, Philmena. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today. And I want to thank all of you for listening and, and joining in and being part of this community because and commenting i want to hear from you like what questions have come up what do you want to know more about your feedback and you do that just in in your review your five star review means so much and your feedback in there i read every single one of them so what do you want to hear more what do you want to hear more of what's fascinating you what questions have come up and or always you can email our team Check out drtrindade.com. She's a wealth of information. She does physician training programs. She's created healing restorative retreats and again, so much more. So I thank you all for being here. God bless you till next time. Thank you.